Welcome to the Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Tuesday, September the 15th, 2020. On the Sunday morning, uh, the 15th, when Cynthia and the other girls came to Sunday school, uh, I remember my mother telling me how she had chided Cynthia because as she was coming out of the house, she uh, noticed that her slip was hanging. And my mother told her to go back in the, in the room. In fact, what I'd like to do is just read a little statement about that because the way my mother presented this to her, I think is, is something pretty typical that mothers would say to their daughters. Uh, my mother stated that, um, young lady, your slip is hanging below your dress. You just don't put your clothes on anyway when you're going to church because you never know how you're coming back. Cynthia had hurriedly made the necessary adjustments, then ran out of the door. My mother never saw her after that. I'm sorry. My, my mother said. That was Shirley Wesley King recounting her sister, Cynthia Wesley. Cynthia Wesley was one of four little girls. Addie Mae Collins. 14, Denise McNair, 11, Carol Robertson, 14, and Cynthia Wesley, 14, four little girls, four little girls. On this episode of The Politocrat, remembering Addie Mae Collins, Denise McNair, Carol Robertson, Cynthia Wesley, 57 years later. That's coming up next. Welcome back. The audio you heard was from Spike Lee's documentary, Four Little Girls, released in 1997. That was 34 years after the horrible events of Sunday, September the 15th, 1963. On that morning, 57 years ago today, four little girls were going to the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, here in the United States. They were preparing for their Sunday school class. They had been in the basement, these four girls. Addie Mae Collins, Denise McNair, Carol Robertson, and Cynthia Wesley. They were in the basement of that church 
in a city that had been exploded by the racism and violence of white male mobs. These four little girls would be blown to bits with a bomb planted by four clansmen. One of these four girls had her head completely blown off her body. Another of the little girls had a brick deeply embedded in her skull. Each of these girls should still be with us today. Who knows what we would have known or learned about the lives of Addie Mae Collins, Denise McNair, Carol Robertson, and Cynthia Wesley had they lived past their early teens or had Denise McNair been able to even get to her teens she was 11 years old Four little girls. Their lives destroyed forever. Their lives ended. Their families' lives destroyed. A community torn asunder. And a movement that would not be stopped. Who knows what these four little girls would have been able to do. Who knows what they would have accomplished in this world. This is one of the most cowardly and dastardly and evil terrorist attacks that America has ever had. To do this, to murder four little girls and to murder them in a church on top of everything else revealed an evil heart one so deeply evil that the depths of that evil is truly unfathomable Addie Mae Collins had dreams and aspirations. Denise McNair had dreams and aspirations. Carol Robertson had dreams and aspirations. Cynthia Wesley had dreams and aspirations. They had the right to live. 
the right to be, the right to live their lives. Their lives mattered. These four black lives mattered. Amidst all the violence, the movement continued. The movement for black lives and black justice and black opportunity continued on. Diane Nash, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Fred Shuttlesworth, James Bevel, Ralph Abernathy, and so many more. John Lewis, Hosea Williams. The movement continued on and continued on regardless. The movement continued on. These four little girls were the courage of this country and they did not have to die. These were four girls, little girls. None of them was even 16 years old. They were just beginning that journey. Just beginning the journey of curiosity, the journey of adolescence. They were just beginning that journey, that move into a different phase of a very young life. They were only beginning that journey, just beginning that journey. Their innocence must be cherished and their innocence must be held dear. When I return, some audio from Spike Lee's film, the documentary Four Little Girls, coming up next. Two weeks before the church was bombed, my mother was in the kitchen and we were getting ready for church and all those things. And she was standing there at the sink and then she turned around and said to Ray, my oldest brother, Ray, I know you've been going out there, leaving those demonstrations, leaving school and going down to Birmingham. I know you've been doing that. He wouldn't deny it. He didn't admit it, but he wouldn't deny it. And she said, but Mama just wants to ask you this. Don't go back into 16th Street Baptist Church. Because God has shown me something terrible is going to happen there. I dreamed, just seemingly out of a clear blue sky, that there was going to be something terrible happening at 16th Street. And I saw a lot of blood. And I mentioned it it, at the breakfast table. It was on a Saturday morning. And I said, please, I don't want any of you. I said, Ray, I don't want you nowhere near 16th Street Baptist Church. And Ray went, Ma, and they said, oh, Esther, don't tell that that I've children any superstitious stuff like that. And she said, no, God has shown me. I dreamed it last night. It was just blood coming all out of that church. It was blood just pouring out of the church. And I don't want any of my blood spilled. And we were all looking like, hmm. And then 
I guess since Ray didn't respond as we normally respond when mama tells you to do something, because we didn't come from one of those families where people, your parents ask you to do something, they told you. And so he didn't respond right. And the next thing, she just fell on her knees. And I, and I started crying because it seemed so real to me in the dream. And, uh, well, when this happened, I think we all thought about it. That was Queen Nun recalling the dream that she had, the powerful dream, the premonition that she had just before the bombing, the terrorist attack on the 16th Street Baptist Church on September the 15th, 1963, 57 years ago today. That was from Spike Lee's documentary, Four Little Girls, which was released in 1997. And you heard the voice of a second woman who was speaking as well, recalling how the premonition and dream of Queen Nun seemed like a lot of nonsense. But unfortunately... It was not. What happened to the four little girls back in 1963 has always struck me personally. I never really understood. And still don't understand. I really don't know what else to say. Because they all should be here still. These four little girls should now be four women in the golden years of their lives. Because that's where they'd be right now. They would be presumably in their golden years, reflecting on life. Maybe they'd still be working in this kind of economy that we have now. And with Social Security being as it is, maybe they'd still be working, some of them. Maybe they would be retiring. Maybe they would be reflecting on the continuation of their business that maybe one of their children was operating. Maybe they would be part of this Black Lives Matter movement. Maybe they would just be resting Reflecting. It's hard to know for sure. But what happened on September the 15th, 1963, at 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, was an atrocity. And one of the most heinous acts of terror that this country, the United States, has ever witnessed. I think that incident, as tragic as it was, convinced white America more deeply than anything else why there had to be a Birmingham confrontation and why Uh, There needed to be a Martin Luther King on the issue of race. The bombing of the churches in in Birmingham with the death of the little girls was just an act of terrorism in my judgment. And those are the many ways, as we know today, the hardest ones to resolve and the cruelest because they they don't care who it is that that gets killed as long as there's some symbolism in what they're doing. 
It just seemed pointless. It wasn't going to stop the movement. Um, it just took the lives of four beautiful, innocent little girls. Those were the voices of Reverend Dr. Wyatt T. Walker, the first voice you heard. The second voice you heard was Nicholas Katzenbach. He was the U.S. attorney in 1963, I believe, under, well, at one point he was the U.S. attorney, the, the attorney general, I believe, in this country at one point. And I forget which administration may have been Kennedy's uh, at the time. Or perhaps, I, I, I don't remember. And you also heard from Andrew Young. Andrew Young, of course, um, part of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And Wyatt T. Walker, I believe, also was at one point um, part of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference as well. Of those three, I believe only Andrew Young continues on this day. He is the only living member, I think, of that trio. They were talking about exactly what that bombing, that atrocity, that evil act was. And I do think that there is some truth in what Katzenbach said. Rather, well, in what all of them said, but particularly, I should say, what Dr. Walker said. And Dr. Walker talked about how white Americans really woke up. And I think there is a lot of truth to that. And we are seeing that again today with George Floyd. Some nearly 60 years later that there is a portion of white America in this country that did wake up again earlier this year. And I don't think there's any turning back. Or at least I hope there is not. We are seeing protests on these streets now, continuing on as we hit the middle of September 2020. And we saw protests and demonstrations and a movement as well 57 years ago that started before this terrorist murderous act and continued on after it. Carol Robertson was laid to rest just two days after she was murdered. Dr. King had been summoned to come to Birmingham after this terrorist act. that took the lives of these four little girls. And he wanted, and he had wanted for all four of them to be funeralized together. And wanted them to be buried together. But Carol Robertson's mother had made it clear that she did not want her daughter to be buried with the other three. Alpha Robertson, the mother of Carol Robertson, wanted her daughter to be buried separately. And as I mentioned, she was. And I think the reason why that was the case, and, and it wasn't talked about in Spike Lee's documentary, but there had been some comments, apparently, that Dr. King had made, and he, he had said that that somehow black people were responsible. 
not responsible for their murders, but responsible for apathy. And he actually had castigated, apparently, some of the black people in Alabama, which obviously would not have gone too well with certainly anybody who had heard that comment, assuming it was said. Carol Robertson, innocent. Addie Mae Collins, innocent. Denise McNair, 11 years old. 11 years old. Innocent. Cynthia Wesley, 14 years old, innocent. All four of these girls. They could have been your sister. They could have been your daughter. Now they could have been your mother or your grandmother now. Your aunt. Four lives that we will never know. What will have become of them all? And I think that's what breaks my heart the most. Obviously the atrocity and the terrorist act that murdered them. But also what their lives could have been, the joy that they had, the joy that they had yet to live through and live on in. The ups and the downs. Who knows what those lives could have been? Who knows? Who knows what those lives and who those lives would have touched in this world? And that, in some ways, is as great an evil, almost as great an evil, as the very act itself, that we will never know. We will never know. Because some evil people, people who hate, people who kill, ended the lives of the innocent in this world. Uh, Denise came in one day and she was saying uh, to my cousin, Helen, and to me, if she could go march. And we said, no, you're too little. She said, well, you're not too little. So I don't know how we conveniently got out of that and, told, and, you know, didn't make ourselves look bad, which is what we felt internally. Here's an infant saying, you can do something about a situation and you refuse. That was Maxine McNair, the mother of Denise McNair. Recalling in Spike Lee's documentary, Four Little Girls, which was released in 1997, And I believe that interview was done in 1996, recalling how her own daughter, Denise McNair, who was just 11 years old, was challenging her own mother to be a part of a movement to march in Birmingham, Alabama. Denise McNair, 11 years old, Challenging her mother to join this movement and march. I wonder, I wonder what Denise McNair would be doing today. There was this movement that continued on, as I mentioned. And it was amidst this movement, even before what happened on September 15th, 1963, that swirled around not just Birmingham, but around many parts of the country. 
And here are some recollections from Spike Lee's documentary, Four Little Girls. Kelly Ingram Park on May 3rd was the turning point in the Birmingham movement. And it was a hot day. Uh, I mean, it was 90 plus and humid in Birmingham. These firemen had been out there for four hours waiting for something to happen that wasn't apparently going to happen. And the crowd again had gathered and somebody threw a brick. And the firemen, you know, in their frustration and loss, they turned that water cannon on. And it was absolute helter skelter. So how you kick boards and blow leaves and things, but this is how folks were. We were rolling across the ground. couldn't grab anything. The dogs were barking, biting. Uh, the police were clubbing and stuff. But the little kid from the inside, for the most part, was protected. I don't know if anybody has ever even thought about the, the pressure on one of those hoses. You could just feel it sting. It was almost like being whipped with a whip or something. And just sort of hit me in the face and went this way and took my hair out. I have always been afraid of dogs. And to have the... Police department have dogs on us. I mean, there were people being bitten by dogs as we were trying to run away from the the, the dogs and the fire hoses with the water that were literally washing children down the streets. She caught me riding on 17th Street in front of uh, a cafe called Zanzibar. That's when it knocked me down. But it was so much of hate here then. So they said, gotta get this lady to the hospital. I said, uh-uh, no, I'm afraid to go to the hospital. No. I didn't know where they'd take me out over there, so I just slept with the Yes, I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna be frank and tell you the truth with the holes and the dogs and the folks. I was really afraid. But I respected what they were marching for. So I didn't march. The violence, the terror, the state violence and terror visited upon black people who were in this movement for black lives, for justice, for civil rights and human rights and voting rights. As recollected in Kelly Ingram Park in Alabama, in Birmingham, a place that saw a lot of police violence against black bodies, against black people who were exercising their First Amendment rights. May 3rd, 1963, where Bull Connor, the police commissioner of Birmingham, Alabama, and a rabid racist who exacted his hatred and contempt for black people in the policies of his police department and his violent, thuggish police. Reflecting the violence and thuggishness of himself and of the state as it exacted and he exacted his hatred upon people who were fighting for justice and freedom and the things that white people in the country have always taken for granted. Here's a recollection from Junie Collins, the sister of Addie Mae Collins. It was just a devastating uh, experience and uh I uh experienced a lot of panic attacks too. Uh, once upon a time I was real afraid of being on the inside outside as well as the inside. Uh of what? Of anywhere. Because the bombing took it happened in a church where you, you normally would feel safe or you think you were safe, you know. And uh, of all places, you know, a church. Junie Collins, recalling in 1996 to Spike Lee during the documentary Four Little Girls that he directed about 
what she is still going through. Her sister murdered. And the kinds of traumas that she continues to experience. Make sure you watch Spike Lee's documentary, Four Little Girls. It was released in 1997 and can be found on streaming platforms. It's a very important documentary and powerful. Definitely powerful. It is a must watch. Welcome back. This is such a solemn day. As you remember four little girls. We must never forget these four little girls. And the truth is that is what they always will be. Their potential blown to bits in an instant. By the evil of this country. And the indifference as well. The hatred. It's difficult to crystallize just how deep a loss and you can't imagine what the families are going through unless you've experienced the same sense of loss, that same loss. <sighs> Bob Chambliss was convicted 14 years after he planted those sticks of dynamite. The Klansman finally was convicted and was sent to prison for his cowardly murderous terrorist act. And less than a year later, on July the 2nd, 1964, Lyndon Baines Johnson, the President of the United States at the time, signed into law the Civil Rights Act. Just over a year after that, on August the 7th, or maybe August the 6th. I always get this date wrong, although I did a podcast on this just a few weeks ago. August of 1965, Lyndon Baines Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act into law. Aluta Continua, the struggle continues. There has been other little girls and little boys 
whose lives have been ended, whether by mobs of white men or by police officers, mostly white police officers. Tamir Rice, 14 years old. Rakia Boyd, also a young girl. A seven-year-old named Ayana. So many others, so many other little boys and girls since, whose lives have been ended. Trayvon Martin, just 17 years old. And so many others. So many others. So many other black lives that I haven't mentioned here. Aluta continua. The struggle continues. The struggle continues. On the Sunday morning, uh, the 15th, when Cynthia and the other girls came to Sunday school, uh, I remember my mother telling me how she had chided Cynthia because as she was coming out of the house, she uh, noticed that her slip was hanging. And my mother told her to go back in the, in the room. In fact, what I'd like to do is just read a little statement about that because the way my mother presented this to her, I think is, is something pretty typical that mothers would say to their daughters. Uh, my mother stated that, um, young lady, your slip is hanging below your dress. You just don't put your clothes on anyway when you're going to church because you never know how you're coming back. Cynthia had hurriedly made the necessary adjustments, then ran out of the door. My mother never saw her after that. My, mo- my mother said, Thank <laughs> you.